For human subjects, the problem of continuity is different from that of other animals. We might say that, thanks to our immersion in the world of language and other systems, where relations are primarily symbolic, personal identity is outsourced. We have to make reference to something outside ourselves to confirm who we are and what we are doing, and the externality of our innermost concerns opens up to a certain displacement of our desire, which we take to be intimate, in relation to place, which we take to be objective. In short, we, as subjects, like other animals, are able to return to the place of enjoyment, but unlike other animals, we are unable to find the object of our desire. What we thought we had enjoyed is not the same as what we find the next time, because our desire has moved on, so to speak. It has redefined itself so that we will experience a lack that will keep us looking for the object that satisfies us, and desire will continue to extend itself and keep us returning to the places to find it. Because desire and place are like conspirators who control our repeated motions, our interest in geography and architecture are critical in the study of psychoanalysis and vice versa. This presentation counts on misreading, misunderstanding, absence, and dissent in the spirit of Charles Baudelaire's funny epithet that thank God we don't understand each other, otherwise we would never be able to agree on anything. Although I don't expect agreement either, I plan to unsettle a few simplistic ideas about architecture and landscape's use of place and open them up to questions about our failure to secure what we value in relation to the external world, namely our knowledge. Here I use the ancient term kenosis, which means that we can know without knowing. We don't know what we know, but also we know what we don't know. Another word for this is psychoanalysis, particularly the work of Jacques Lacan. But since Lacan has the book club problem shown in the Tom Gold cartoon, I have to claim the kenosis connection. Lacan is the perfect fuel for theory because of his style of writing, which has been called me dear, or saying things by halves. The reader was required to think further than the writing actually takes them. Thinking is indispensable. At the same time, Lacan pushes theory into the materiality of space and time in such a way that we find that things are backwards. We are most alienated about the things that are most personal. As Freud said, we are not masters in our own house. At the same time, we find ourselves strangely at home in the most bizarre remote situations, even in the projective geometries that Lacan derives from topology and the uncanny of anamorphosis. This topsy-turvy combination of intimate alienation and external familiarity is particularly evident in questions about knowledge, which the Lacanian psychoanalyst Dan Collins has presented in terms of a formula that never fails to fail, the idea of justified true belief. The problem named after Edmund Gettier, who brought this ancient definition into focus as a problem in epistemology. Ever since Plato, we have found problems with this formula, and most critics have found it necessary to add a fourth term to the triad to explain why it doesn't work, but why things that aren't knowledge seem to work as substitutes in real life. Collins' original contribution to the JTB, or Justified True Belief Formula, looks specifically at these substitutes and compares their relationship to that uniquely Lacanian idea of jouissance, what we make of enjoyment when we go back to a place we once found, but discover that the source of enjoyment is not there. If it weren't for jouissance, there would be no reason to do architecture theory or human geography to supplement the clinical project of psychoanalysis and vice versa. Back in the 1960s, it was fashionable to talk about mental maps, 
Saul Steinberg took advantage of this to produce the New Yorker cover, View from Ninth Avenue. This is a map of sorts, shown in a perspective that abbreviates things New Yorkers don't care to know, which is mostly everything between them and points of interest that are generalized on the thin edge at the horizon. You might say that New Yorkers don't know much about geography and are proud of it, that their kenosis is a proof of citizenship, but this proves something critical about the relation of the local to the global. We can't draw a line around a city or region because space refuses to be enclosed so simply. It stretches and contracts space and time as a way of managing the places we return to in search of pleasure, so that desire can be extended indefinitely. And in this plasticity, the mental map not only stretches and squeezes, but twists and folds. It intersects itself in unexpected ways. It hides what we want, but also brings anxieties we thought were far away much, much closer. Like the warning on the side mirror of our car, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. And this over-proximity is what makes New Yorkers defend themselves by keeping the Pacific Ocean close at hand and at the same time infinitely far away, thanks to the geography of I don't care. Steinberg's mental map idea caught on quickly because it was a general theory about locality, a nearly form of GPS, which we all know is less about wayfinding and more about anxiety. What killed the mental map idea in geography theory was the fact that there was no template of objectivity. All maps are distortions. All are ideological. There are no straight lines on the Earth's curved surface, at least not ones we can use in daily experience. But distortion itself is something we know well because every desire involves it in the form of self-intersection, finding our intimate desire in remote conditions and non-orientation to the pilgrimage to the object we desire that ends in a paradox. This is nowhere more evident than our experience of the simple lines we try to draw in what seems to be geographical situations dictated by the most basic needs. In World War I, there was the famous function of the front, which technically was just one line, but was really two, an eastern front for the army on the west and a western front for the army on the east. These two fronts didn't coincide. There was a necessary gap between them. Slavoj Žižek has recounted the lore that grew up around this space, which directly contradicts the anthropologist Marc Auger's idea of the in-between as devoid of meaning and purpose. Because deserters from both armies had nowhere else to go, they hid in the bomb craters, ruins, and blasted carcasses of what was called the no-man's land. They were criminals, unified by their legal status, but polarized by their armies of origin. But the common aim to stay hidden generated a utopian impulse. In fact, they achieved a kind of utopian League of Nations well before Woodrow Wilson proposed it in 1918. This utopia was not planned. It emerged, and it holds the keys to emergence and emergence's relation to topology. The overlap of criminality actually creates a knowledge condition where unlike the justified true belief, there is the unjustifiable absence of belief or any basis of belief that creates a truth that is more binding because it is not a truth about stuff, but a truth about truth itself. Within this criminal overlap, deserters and abandoned survivors were able to communicate even though they spoke multiple languages, organized their searches for food and supplies, and maintained a rule of law. In short, they did what the war professed to do through armed conflict, but did it in a kind of anti-world where ideals and principles were not allowed. The emergent utopia of no man's lands was simultaneously the utopia of emergence, the fact that things can appear out of a void or nowhere condition. This is not just a problem for theory. It is the problem that defines what theory should do and how it should do it. In fact, the emergence of cooperative society in the dystopian conditions of no man's land reveals a pure structure 
which I am showing here as a lambda or fulcrum that finds a balance that has already and always existed, but has been latent. What operationalizes this latency is the discovery that the need for concealment is simultaneously a means of camouflage, and that there is a logic behind the insulation that buffers the space that is a dystopia from the outside, but a utopia from the inside. Theory in architecture, geography, and psychoanalysis must theorize this situation. But as Lacan said, it is not enough to have a theory, you have to have a plan. Dan Collins has responded to this call by returning to the problem of knowledge as justified true belief, JTB, to raise old questions in new ways. Collins has looked at those things that have claims to be a kind of knowledge but fail. Failure is not random. It is structured by the relation to the beliefs based on our personal, perceptual, and embodied relations to the material world, actual and virtual, by the justifications we feel compelled to make to explain our intimate encounters and plans, and finally, by the relation to truth we claim or fail to claim to make. Even when we renounce the truth, as we must when we adopt Karl Popper's principle of refutation, the modus tollens principle, that nothing can be scientific unless we submit it to disproof, we are making a claim about truth itself. Collins expands the Gettier problem like an accordion whose key plates are knowledge and science, pushing and pulling the bellows in between, where faith, resistance, rumor, Error, justification, and rationalization are the tones made by removing one or more notes of the triad. Collins is the first to do this, and my ambition is to use this middle field as a platform to define the equally criminal middles of architecture and geography, where emergence produces a space of effectiveness, where the force of holding things together seems to come out of nowhere. Indeed, this nowhere has always had a reputation for criminality, and in many cases confounded the evil of nowhere with an unlimited good. So like Socrates in the Symposium, I will present the devil as simply a demon, specifically the demon of Eros, who appears out of a nowhere in gifts of life, gifts of death, gifts of knowledge, or gifts of mysterious value we call a galma. Whether it's Faust or St. Catherine of Siena on the receiving end of the Galma, the point is that Eros connects the nowhere of its origin with the all-to-somewhere of the beneficiary in a place usually described as between a rock and a hard place. This no man's land has such an antiquity to it that theory can use, as a reality check, the likelihood that artists and philosophers of the first water would have something to say about it, and their evidence would be both consistent and consistently enigmatic. Durer's evidence, for example, used one of the four ancient medical diagnostic categories, melancholia, to make a point about the self-intersection and non-orientation that Lacan would explore later through the projective geometry of Mobius bands and Klein bottles. By purposefully misspelling melancholia, the mathematician David Ritz Finkelstein has noted something that the art historian who wrote the most famous account of this image had missed, that melancholia is an anagram for the gate of heaven, a portal connecting the world of apparent symbolic stress with a wisdom lying beyond the definition of justified true belief. Steinberg's depiction of the stress of the symbolic also seems to contain anagrams, but more graphic ones, where instead of rearranged letters we are given the criminal versions of things that are designed to trick us. In Steinberg's streetscapes, we have, instead of truth, the schema of confidence tricks, the con, which target us, the dupes of the trick. The medium that actualizes the con is the literal middle, played by the shill, who appears to be on our side, but is actually working for the con artist, whose clever disguise is a binary mask 
all the more effective because we, the victims, are invited to construct it. In this way, we are made to think we take in a full panorama of truth, but we are actually missing the full half, which functions fully as a half, a half concealed, as this cartoon panel from George Harriman's famous strip, Crazy Cat, shows. This amazing strip, by the way, was about half beings, a cat in love with a mouse, a mouse intent on hitting the cat on the head with a brick out of an ancient revenge over an event he can't remember, and a brick ordinance whose function is to be a messenger of the demon Eros. Steinberg's familiar but unfamiliar landscapes give way to a cabinet of curiosities, the corruption of knowledge we can truly believe into a scam that sets up a camp outside our conscious awareness and is thus a kind of criminal unconscious, not just a concealed crime. The criminality of the unconscious mind itself is the way it holds together in an enigmatic way, just as the Borromeo knot used by the family of the same name to proclaim its unity owed to an invisible force was appropriated by Jacques Lacan to talk about the jouissance that held together rings representing the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real, or our relation to signifiers, our sensory experience, and the traumas that structure both, thanks to our inability to remember them, but only experience them through the costumes of anxiety, compulsion, and hysterical displacement. We can use Lacan's labels to see how the real, imaginary, and symbolic of psychoanalysis correspond to true justified belief. But it's more important to remember how the Getje problem is a problem in that it requires criminality or failures of justified true belief to bring it into focus. The key is, fortunately for architecture, geography, and the visual arts, the way that the imaginary or the perceptual belief component combines polar opposites in ways related to the phenomenon of anamorphosis, latent images hidden within perspectival images, whose imposture is to present the world as we think it should look. When we find the anamorphic image, it's like discovering how we've been tricked by the ordinary perception of desire to see something interesting, useful, or concerning. The anamorph is like the shill of the confidence trick. The shill attracts us by being an object of desire, but she's really working for the con, which is also short for conspiracy. This is a fake version of the true, but it's the truth about truth, which makes the fake superior to the supposed real thing. This is the trauma of our discovery, that we have been duped. We are more familiar with being duped than we may think we are, thanks to the technology that has evolved in the past two decades. Lacan anticipated this with only minimal clues in the 1960s, but he did a pretty good job of understanding how the gadgets that connect our locales to global networks would involve the clear markings of the scam. His term for the gadgetry that would simultaneously enamor us and betray us included an etymological element of latency, coupled with the Greek word for essence, the latus. It is tempting to neologize another term, jouessence, jouessence, the essence that invites us to enjoy but punishes us ultimately. The big con we know all too well. This is the way that every local use is collected, sorted, and reconstructed to exploit our desire to consume and know things. I want to show, theoretically, how the Latus and Alethosphere actually work. How, like No Man's Land of World War I, is, like Steinberg's view from 8th Avenue, an accordion space of failed attempts to know the truth, where the failures are actually a map of the truth of truth. My method is a hitherto unrealized aspect of the Borromeo knot, a method invented by Gauss to describe the logic of knots by notating the over and under patterns of the way chords cross other chords. 
A Gauss count of the Borromeo knot shows that the rings seem to lie on top of each other, but each ring also manages to tuck under the next one, so that any ring is technically speaking both on top and bottom. This inside-out quality is the basis of what Lacan called extimite, the inside-out function. But here in the Gauss count, we can see how the inside-out works to open up a passageway that, like the zigzag networks set up in no man's land, made a utopia out of dystopia by creating a space of effectiveness. Just as jouissance is the glue holding the three rings together, sometimes seen as a small fourth ring, the glue is actually virtual and anamorphic in relation to the rings. It's a space where a lambda-like force can rise and fall, creating a fold or mirroring function. In the case of the overlapping, or rather non-overlapping, fronts of World War I, the lambda creates a pocket space where the function of folding becomes a camouflage, protecting the deserters so that they can survive by organizing their salvaging and other cooperative efforts. Where the armed conflict seems to present a choice, a winner or a loser, we know in advance that this is a kind of forced choice, no matter which side wins, both will suffer a defeat, and no matter which side loses, it will be strengthened, just like the antibiotics strengthened viruses, and just like the Treaty of Versailles made possible the rise of Adolf Hitler. Binary conflicts and spaces of contention should look instead to the third pill they had inadvertently created by the one front with two faces, the green pill that was a space of effectiveness. We have funnier versions of the green pill solution in the film The Truman Show, where a dupe, Truman, is raised from infancy to be the solitary subject of a total surveillance, broadcast 24-7 to an audience who focuses on his life in detail. All the other seeming residents of this fake Florida coastal town are actors, or shills. The director, a con with the all-too-suggestive name Christoph micromanages Truman's everyday experiences from a control room concealed in a fake moon. Truman seems to be offered only a red pill of escape, or a blue pill of contentment going along with the scam of being an unwitting TV star. But the key lies in the anamorphosis of his belief that congeals around specific mystery points, where he seems to have found his lost father, where he falls in love with a woman who decides to disobey the director, or where he suspects that his fear of water has been cultivated to prevent his discovery that this ocean is really a contained pond. His green pill is the imaginary that is turned from the director in the moon to his every object of desire, intensifying it by trying to turn it around. The green pill spins Truman from his desire to his doubt, making it the key middle term in the accordion functions that keep him from discovering the truth, or rather, the truth of truth, that replaces the Gettier model of justified true belief. Just what does this accordion look like? Dan Collins, we have to remember, is the first to pull the bellows between knowledge and science apart to inhale the criminal vapors of other kinds of truth claims. By removing one or two components in various positions, Collins shows how the weakness of the JTB Gettier formula expands into a table. First, we get faith, which is something we believe to be true but cannot justify to others who don't belong to our church, so to speak. Second, we have resistance, something commonly encountered in psychoanalysis, where the patient or analysand has access to both justification and truth, but doesn't believe in either. The ignorant subject neither believes in truth nor makes any attempt to justify it. But justification and belief survive by themselves in the case of error. And rumor and rationalization can live on the even slimmer diet of either belief or justification. The other side of the bellows of this truth accordion is science, 
which disavows any privileged connection to justifications or beliefs and puts truth to the test by proving it negatively, by trying to disprove it, the famous modus tollens test of Karl Popper or the negative hypothesis of grad school dissertations. What's very interesting about Collins' JTB table is the way you can convert the checks and X's into ones and zeros, which immediately shows that they count from the binary number seven down to zero. The binary numbers show how truth and justification are like the French on one side and the Germans on the other, and how belief, the green pill of the Borromeo knot, is like a shill that spins between the idea and the application, the alethosphere and the latus or gadget. You can describe the table either from the side of truth or the side of the symbolic justification, thanks to the spinning function of the perceptual belief, which, thanks to anamorphosis, is able to preserve latency and deploy it for the sake of survival, just as the deserters did in No Man's Land. The green pill solution looks at the anamorphosis of belief as a dimension that pushes up the lambda's peak. Like Lacan's mirror stage, the armies on either side of this double front look at life from both sides now, either as a Euclidean perspective picture, where the fronts of things conceal the backs and generate shadows behind their local horizons, but where there is the alternative of a true geometry that conceals itself through the topology of self-intersection and non-orientation. I use the Mobius band as the simplest means of explaining this rather complicated relationship. Because the logical priority of projective geometry is discovered only after we encounter it as an anamorphic element in Euclidean experience, we have the temporal paradox that what comes first only appears second in opposition to what has been claimed to be first in an act of imposture. This is Lacan's famous formula, the apres coup or retroaction principle. There is an uncanny sense that comes with retroaction in that it seems to convey a warning or sense of dread or reminder that we have forgotten something important. This sense of dread is felt intimately in the form of an unavoidable contradiction, in the way that a Mobius band offers us the chance to complete a circuit, but then retracts this promise by showing that we are just on the other side of the mark we made at the beginning of our journey. We have to make another circuit, another 180 degree trip, that we had mistakenly thought was 360 degrees. This paradox of having two dots for one position, or one side where two sides seem obvious, has the mathematical name of idempotency, meaning the power of the same. This is a big deal for the middle term function of appearances, since the appearance of the Mobius band is what delivers this experience that we can justify being on two sides, but the truth of the matter is that there is only one side and one edge. Between truth and justification, idempotency is another name for anamorphosis of the imaginary, or in Getje terms, belief. This is the revolutionary discovery of Collins' expansion of the Getje table as a kind of lung breathing in the air of contradiction. From inside, what we regard as the most personal, the most intimate aspect of truth, appearances, we discover a twisty function that converts truth into falsehood and the falsehood into truth. This is the Cretan liar paradox, where the speaker who places himself outside of his claim is to be found again inside the frame he uses to represent his own truth. The lying Cretan is also telling the truth, and the truth is that he's lying. There's something funny about this that makes us laugh, but it's a joke at our expense. And this pain-pleasure combination tells us that between the true-false positions we can make, there is an interval of jouissance that makes the circuit spiral around itself, a small displacement that works like a solenoid in an electrical circuit, pulling desire through a second void 
created thanks to the first void, the small gap. Here in a nutshell, we have the reason why human subjects return to places to find pleasures, but in fact encounter the pain of loss because the object they seek has been redefined and desire continues its search. The Gettier table turns out to be a matrix of imposture, charade, and a trick that makes us smile or even laugh at our own detachment from the truth. Thanks to the binary count, however, we can see how the unit works. At first, it is on the side of justification. It turns on and off. And like a light switch, things seem to be reversible. Lights on, lights off. But the other side of this off-on function is the idempotency switch, the elevator button that requires only one push to call the elevator. And that one is the binary that allows the whole matrix to reverse itself to provide a difference that is symmetrical. This forces an internal rearrangement where faith, error, ignorance, and rationalization are all forced to suffer the fact that they are different from their mirror images. And so now 0, 1, 1 becomes 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1 becomes 1, 1, 0. We learn from this, however, how faith is logically tied to rationalization, which is something we experience every day, particularly in the arguments against vaccination and masks, as if Jesus could justify a fundamentally irrational position. Or we learn how ignorance and error are actually palindromically linked in experience, where the reversal tells the story of how justification and belief must trade places when the idiot becomes the fool. The flip side of the Gettier table tells a different story, but it does show how utopia arises from dystopia, or how non-spatiality and non-temporality give rise to new configurations that are even more effective. Our reality check should find cases in history where this same insight has been employed using the same functions of après coup retroaction and mirror reversals. Hans Holbein's famous 1533 portrait of two French ambassadors gives us just such a check, but its truths go far beyond the simple discovery that the blur at the feet of the two rich guys is actually a skull that can be seen only at a point to the lower left of the main image. It's a reminder of our mortality, a memento mori, which we might blow off as a counterweight to all of the boastful wealth we see displayed in the dress and costly possessions of the two subjects, all of which, by the way, relate to ways of determining a position in time or space or both. The angle of the skull connects with the horizon and the crucifix at the upper left to create a relation between the viewer in the position of death and Christ's sacrifice on the hill of Golgotha, where we connect the wooden cross of crucifixion to the cross that Lacan draws across the S, standing for the subject, to separate consciousness from unconsciousness, to make every subject a case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But it's also the bar drawn across every signifier, to mean that it must signify not a concrete object, but another signifier, the of preposition is replaced by the bar that is the distinction that, in linguistics, is the minimal requirement imposed on signifiers, that they signify only difference. Holbein shows us another way to think about difference. He puts information on the other side of his painting that explains why the lines on the front are actually one line that has opened up an in-between space, a space not of representational truths, but rather a truth of truth. In this case, the truth of the end game of all subjectivity. This is a date that is over precise. Instead of the usual day, month, and year, we are given additional information that is over correct, 4 p.m. This turns out to be significant in light of the fact that April 11th in 1533 was Good Friday. The day, of course, when Christ died at age 33, another employment of the number three that we find in 1533 and the angle of the determining lines of the anamorphic skull. The sun was exactly 27 degrees above the London horizon at 4 p.m. 
the precise time when astronomers and astrologers such as Luca Pacioli, Holbein's close friend, predicted the end of the world. The apocalypse didn't happen, of course, at least not in the way we usually think it will happen. But this is actually a fake apocalypse, a movie version like a global disaster film, where a heroic couple actually managed to save the world. The real apocalypse is an internal rather than an external affair. It is the unary trait, the function of idempotency, where something additional is included without making any difference whatsoever in the final sum. This is the role of latency, that it is present without making a difference. It can be packed inside, it can be infinite, without changing the dystopian balance that emerges out of imbalance, the truth of truth that emerges out of truth failure, the middle bellows of the Gettier table. As distruth creates spaces between knowledge and science, it creates a kind of manger sponge of fractal opportunities that populate the in-between, places of self-intersection and non-orientation. In the fractal subtraction of the manger sponge, we discover the anorexic's truth that you can actually eat nothing, that nothing, with a capital N, is something to be reckoned with, not just a missing something. We subjects return to places of pleasure and find that our object of desire has moved on. But what we really find is the peculiar happiness of loss, a pleasure in defeat that justifies our belief in the utopia of dystopia and the trick of truth that makes it all about its undeniable failure. <laughs>